You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. Hi, I'm Jennifer Wood. And I'm Jennifer Connor from Equestrian Businesswomen, and you're listening to Equestrian B2B, the podcast that brings together industry leaders, entrepreneurs, and equestrians for conversations about how they build and sustain a successful business. On today's show, we speak to harness driver Lauren Tritton about conducting business internationally, her move to the U.S. from Australia, and being the first female driver to win the Battle of Lake Erie. Lauren Tritton was born in Australia and has been an equestrian her entire life. She competed in her first horse show in 1995. In 2015, she switched to driving standardbred racehorses. She has won the Young Drivers Premiership, the New South Wales Premiership, and was the first woman to win the Metropolitan Drivers Premiership and two different track premierships in one year. In 2018, Lauren and her family relocated to the United States. Since moving, she was the first woman to drive in and win the Battle of Lake Erie in Ohio, the first female to drive in the $600,000 Meadowlands Pace in New Jersey, and the winner of the female invitational race held at the Meadowlands Racetrack. Lauren's goal is to inspire as many women as possible in this industry to go out and show the world how powerful women are. She currently resides in New York with her husband, two children, two dogs, and stable of 25 standard breads. Hi, Lauren. It's so great to have you on. I'm really excited because I get to feature somebody from harness racing, which is super exciting for me. And I am so impressed with a lot of things that you've done in your life. And I really wanted you to come on and share them with everybody here. Cool. Thanks for having me, guys. It's really exciting to be a part of this. And um, it's not often I get to do these sort of things. So uh, hopefully it's all run smoothly. Uh, yeah. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're going to jump right in. And obviously, I'm sure our listeners can tell by now that you're not from the United States. So can you go ahead and tell us um, when you relocated and came to the United States? Yeah, look, um, we just went over three years now that we relocated to the States. Um, me and my husband, uh, you know, decided to make a crazy move over to the States with uh, a team of horses and uh, have a crack at um, some of the racing styles over here. And uh, so far, so good. Um, you know, we ride the waves. They go up, they go down in the equestrian world, as we all know. But, um, you know, it's, it was a really risky move. Uh, my husband and I were the leading trainer and driver. And I was driver. He was trainer in Australia. Um, you know, so we had to up and leave a lot, um, a lot of clients, um, a lot of um, horses behind. But we, we picked a, a, a certain amount of horses that we thought were good enough for the caliber of racing over here. And, um we, we, we made the move. What made you decide to make that move? Um, look, uh, like, I, like I mentioned before, we were both leading um, in, our, in our country and um, we just financially weren't where we, where we were at. Um, we, um, you know, researched a lot of American um, uh, racing and if we could do a better financially over here and that's um, kind of why we made the move um, and I we think it was a better lifestyle for us we have two kids so um, it was kind of a more of a less um, busy lifestyle for us to um, be in the United States. What have been some of the biggest challenges that you've had coming over here? Um Learning uh, the climate, the climate in, in New York is obviously up and down. It's either hot or snowing. So it was really quite difficult for us to um, maintain our horse's health. Um, the feeding was a lot of different feed styles, um, the the different types of uh, medical treatments. They all have different names. They all end up being the same thing, but they all had different names. You know, we didn't kind of know what to go to. Um yeah, and just, yeah, the most important thing is being climate, you know, making sure the horses are healthy and drinking a lot when it's snowing, um, making sure they're drinking a lot when it's hot. Um, you know, we, when we seen our first uh, ice water buckets in the morning, we, we kind of panicked a little bit and we, we weren't prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think any of us, even that live in New York, are prepared for the, the morning when you walk in and you're like, it's so cold that the, the water buckets are iced over. The, the anxiety mm. after spring is just it's next level I I just like here we go again you know and mm -hmm. it's so horrible it's horrible so is the climate in Australia uh pretty consistent then 
Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like Florida. It doesn't get cold enough to um, to snow. I mean, we have had snow before, but not, nothing like 12 inches of trudging through snow and trying to work racehorses and, you know, you know the whole story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jen's in Florida, so. Oh, nice. Yeah, <laughs> I, but I grew up in Chicago, so I, oh, okay. I understand the whole ice buckets and oh, riding when you can't feel your toes and yeah, or even like below your hips. <laughs> any, any piece of clothing or equipment that we owned in Australia it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's all new. And so in in moving your business, um, you know, you've t- you've talked a lot about kind of the challenges of on the horse side. What are the biggest differences in running your business in the U.S. versus Australia? Um, yeah, look, we still have a few um, clients from Australia. Um, I, I I find it quite difficult. I like to be up and personal with my with my clients, so um, for them not to be able to come to the races and watch their horses race is quite that's quite difficult for me because I'd love them to be involved as much as possible um running my business wise it's a lot of my owners my clients so they 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 just kind of do the harness racing as as more of a hobby where a lot of my other trainers they that was their that was their only income so um you know there's a lot, a lot more of my clients that have more horses. Um, there's not that much, that much more different. Um, speaking terms of um, me speaking to my clients is a lot more difficult because they all have different terms in racing wise. That that was quite difficult at the beginning. They're like, "What the hell are you saying?" But <laughs> um, I don't think there would be that much of a difference um, running my business, other than I do like to connect with my owners a lot more. I. Um, if anything, I have um, been more um, on the social media side of things for my owners that can't be involved. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't, I'm, I'm a lot more social media um, um, aware than what I was last time hmm. in Australia. And did you bring employees with you from Australia? Uh, no, I didn't. It is quite difficult for people to come. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but it was yeah. quite good for us to stay here um so um i have had a lot of interest in uh people from australia to come over but with all the uh covid and whatnot um and the government it's quite difficult for them to come over at this time but i'm sure um there would be some more a lot more interest if it was a little bit more easier for them yeah makes sense yeah and do your owners get to that are in australia do they use um do they watch the races at all? Are they able to do that? Um, yeah, we found a way for them to, um, you know, be involved as much as possible. Um, it's quite difficult with the time zone. Uh, they're 14 hours mm-hmm. ahead of us, so it's they've got to get up at, you know, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning to watch their horse race or stuff like that. But, I mean, a lot of my owners are very, like, very involved in their horses. So, um, you know, they will make the, the sacrifice of the 2 o'clock three o'clock morning rise, but, um, you know, they, 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 there's RTN and TVG, they, they log on the line and they get to watch their horses run. So it's good for them. How did you get owners here and, and clients here in the United States? Um, you know, just, uh, Shane and I are very, um, we're outgoing people. We like to meet a lot of people. Um, you know, we, we, um, you know, put out, sent out a couple of emails to clients that we knew before um, we came over here and we went to the uh, Lexington sales and we met a lot of people. Um, we do a lot of um, breaking in ourselves of the, of the yearlings. So um, people like that idea that we kind of had that um, first touch of the horses and ourselves and, and, and go on to train those horses as they grew through um, their paces and um yeah and then you know word of mouth friends of friends and and we like to get new clients um so you know if you go out to the grocery store and you turn around and Shane's telling someone about how great it is to own a harness racing <laughs> things like that so I mean it's it's been weird um, some of the people that we have met along the way yeah that's kind of cool and and one thing I like to say about harness racing is I feel like it's a little bit uh, more achievable for people who are interested in horses to be hands-on with harness racing versus like owning a thoroughbred. Yeah. And like I said to you before, I like to make my owners a lot of hands-on, you know, they're welcome at the barn anytime, um, you know, and I'll go out and do um, things with the horses, you know, like I've done things before, like taking a horse to a, um, 
an event and had a little area where they could come and meet the horses and pat the horses and things like that. I, I love doing those sort of things. So, um, you know, it, it's it's really good to have new new people along the way. Mm. And I think that's how you grow the sport and you grow the interest in supporting it and knowing that, the, you know, there are accessible ways to to be involved and to have ownership. I think a lot of people, if they didn't know the equine industry at all, would think, well, I could never own a racehorse, but yeah. there are pretty easy ways to get into it. Yeah. I also think too, a lot um, in Australia, there's, there's one thing different here that I would love to make a change in is uh, with the casino and the grandstand are on one side and the paddock for the racehorses are on the other side. It kind of pulls apart um, mm. people that would love to have ever own a horse. Um, in Australia, the, the paddock and the grandstand are next to each other. So there is that chance for the people without without being dangerous to come and have a look at the horses and see what goes on behind the scenes without there's a fence between them. So it's not it's not a dangerous thing to do, but it gives them that little bit of insight of what actually goes on behind the scenes without just seeing the horses out on the track. Um, I would love to make some sort of viewing viewing area for for people, the public to come in and have a look um, mm. without being in anyone's way or, or harm's way um, of, of actually seeing what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because even people who are in the horse industry, um, when you go to the and they have access on the backside of the racetrack, it's like a whole different experience for them. Yeah, and sure. they think it's really cool. Yeah. Like I've been in horses on my life and I've, I've actually um, been in the thoroughbred industry and, and road, road track work and stuff. And I'll still go to the gallops now and I'll go and watch them saddle up a horse. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm interested myself because it's not something that I do every day. So, I mean, I could, t- I could um, only imagine what the young, young girls that come to the races and, and would see me harnessing up a horse and be like, wow, look at all that pink, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah. be interested in, in what I'm actually doing. Yeah. yeah. And- yeah, actually, um, this earlier this summer, uh, I took Jen and a couple of other friends to the backside up at Saratoga. Yeah. And, you know, like everybody's like, we were up close and personal and we watching, yeah. we were watching them gate schooling and breaking out of the gate. And, you know, I take it for granted because I've done it a lot. But, yeah. you know, sometimes it, it's great to be able to bring people into the backside and, and see that everybody's like a normal person, right? And it is, it's achievable. But the fact that you do horses non-stop and still get that thrill and excitement could only imagine what those other people that ne- have never touched a horse or seen mm-hmm. a horse twice you know the, the thrill that must go to them it's just it's just incredible and I, I mean there's so many things we could do to get younger people in and, and other other people in um to this industry and it's just that that's what me and my husband strive to do yeah did you have to change your business model at all when you moved here no, I don't think so. Um, we obviously had to work a lot harder um, and kind of start at scratch again with our business. Yeah. Um, that was quite hard. And it's quite scary at some times because we're the new guys and I'm not very good at being the new guy. Um, but, yeah, I, my husband is very good like that. And he led led the way. But, yeah, I mean, just, just being the new guys again was, was quite difficult. But um, apart from changing, I don't, I don't think so. And what kind of advice can you give if somebody is looking to re- relocate their business internationally? And it doesn't just have to be like to the United States from someplace else, but if they're making an international move. Yeah. Um, it's scary. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hide that. It's extremely scary, but you've got to take a risk. If you, if you want to do something, don't, don't half do it. You got to, you got to just gulp and take the risk and uh, it can fail. I mean, or by all means, it, it can fail, but, just keep going. Um, you know, you, 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 like I say, you can't half do it. You got to just take the risk, take the dive, and uh, hopefully it works out on the way. And, and don't be shy. You know, you got to go out there and meet new people. That's that's the only way that you the roots of your business will grow. Yeah. And you know, just going back to what you were talking about and having the public able to see. Um you guys working with the horses and they're able to get up close. It reminds me of at jumper shows. They have a lot of them have made the warm up um, ring public. So anybody can go and watch them school and get ready for the big class. And a lot of the riders will stop their horse and let people pet them and things like that. So 
I, I've, I see that more in a lot of the bigger equine events um, in other disciplines too. Yeah. And, you know, that was something that you'd like to see the U S adopt more in, in racing and the way the setup is. Um, is there anything else that you see the U S it could learn from the sport in Australia? Um, look, I mean, I feel like America is very, um, they don't like change much. Um, it's kind of, you know, stuck in their, in their ways. And it, it, that's, that is quite difficult for me because like I said, I love involving younger people. So, and the only way you can involve younger people is to make changes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have a little girl, she's two years old and, you know, I had to take it to the races with me yesterday and it was just like locking a lion in a cage, you know, I had to make sure that she stayed in that room, you know, and there there was two young girls on the side of the fence yesterday and they were screaming, girl power, girl power. (laughs) Now the only time they seen me was that three seconds that I was just walking past the fence, you know, that I feel like there needs to be some sort of area that those young girls could watch um, the horses for a lot longer time than the one minute 50 they get going around the track you know um Mm. you know and I'm even all for um you know like the the young the the mini trotting the mini trotting is quite large in Australia you know every race meeting that you go to there's a mini trotting event where the the I think it's up to up to 13 hands um in the sulky um and I think you had to be three years old uh and up oh my gosh wow (laughs) (laughs) I cannot imagine my three-year-old trotting a horse yeah wild (laughs) I mean there's some ponies running around everywhere but um you know that's really fun that's at every race meeting you know all across all across the country so um yeah that and they're the roots of our sport um So here's me with my two-year-old daughter locked in a room until mommy finishes what she's doing where she could be out on the track learning the ropes and becoming yeah. the next world-famous trotting driver. You know what I mean? Right. There's I, there's just needs – I feel like that would be a great thing for family. It's I, I feel like here it's less of a family event um, than Australia and um, I feel like um, that if we could do something like that, that it would get more of a family-orientated sport. Yeah. I think a lot of equestrian sport is really coming to a reckoning. And we've talked to people about this before about social license of the sport and, you know, how we have to make other people outside the sport understand what it is we do with the horses and how well they get treated. And, um, and I think that starts with kids for sure. And, yeah. you know, getting kids more, more kids interested in it and, and knowing that there is an accessible way into the sport. Yeah. Um, I just, I feel like, you know, it's not until you're 16 that you're allowed to, you know, being in the paddock with the horses. And I feel like mm. that's too late to be learning about the road. Sure. Because, you know, um, I remember when I was a kid, I think I started four years old at Pony Club. I did my mm. first for sure two years old and I started pony club at four and then I never stopped riding since I was four years old so you know I think 16 is too late to be to be learning about the horse ropes you know and I know there is that um youth program that they have but I don't feel like they get enough recognition um you know and it's just in one little area like it why is it not at every racetrack it's it's more of a family place and and I mean too that you know I know it's dangerous but the kids need to learn you know they need yeah. to learn. I mean I, it gives the kids something to do yeah and I think there's ways to involve them you know without throwing them to the wolves and putting them in dangerous situations you know there's plenty of older horses that are perfectly fine to groom or to tack up and yeah um yeah I think you know, we have Pony Club here too, and it's so important to have that background. And you have to be a horseman; like you yeah. have to understand that you can't just jump into the sport and and think you're gonna do well and and okay. win and and keep horses going. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. It, it's hard to to develop um, good horsemanship. You know, when when you don't know the lingo and it's mm. it's almost like, you know, all of us have been doing it since we were young. So it's 
in, ingrained in us, right? Like you don't have to think about your reactions to things. Mm. And and I see that in kids when they play other sports and hockey and soccer and football, you know, it's just ingrained in them because they started when they're so young. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I know um, I was on the board of the Harness Horse Youth Foundation and it's a great program, but it struggles a lot for financing. And, you know, it would be great to have it everywhere so yeah. that it gave the kids something to do. And I think here a lot of times a struggle too is everybody's afraid of getting sued. Right? Oh, yeah. You know, because it's yeah. dangerous. <laughs> I never heard of suing until I came to America. So <laughs> yeah. right. welcome yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to our litigious and society. Here we are. <laughs> so um so you mentioned that you've been riding since you were young. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about your riding experience and then how you transitioned into harness racing from there? Yeah, so um, I obviously, I started off uh, Pony Club, um, did Pony Club for a while. Um, I actually, um, I ended up getting, um, I think I was 14 years old. Um, I drove my first pacer. There was a a barn behind um, uh, my paddock where I rode the horses and they asked for some barn help and they threw me out on this pacer and no idea how to stop, how to go, how to steer. I was like driving a Big Mac truck. (laughs) <laughs> and, um I loved it it was the biggest adrenaline rush I'll uh, become an absolute adrenaline junkie I was like get me out the next one um you know and I was uh, riding professionally for at horse shows for other stables and I needed a pick to do one or the other um I ended up leaving school to go and work for that barn because I didn't want anything to do with school anymore. Um, <laughs> and I was going to the races and they said, I want to get my license. I want to get behind that mobile car. I want to, I want to go. And it all bloomed from there. And then I got this crazy idea to start the thoroughbreds as well. So I was doing thoroughbreds at three o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. till 10 o'clock. And then I was 10 o'clock to the races from then. That all became way too much for me. Um, and I become, I be, ended up becoming a full-time harness racing driver at 16 and, um, ha- the, my dream came true. I became the first female to, um, the, the youngest female to drive a, uh, stakes winner, group one winner. Um, I had driven four of those winners, um, by the age of 18. Uh, I became the first um, female driver to win the uh, Metropolitan um, Drivers Premiership, which is um, all the stakes race premierships. Um, I become the youngest driver to get reach 500 winners by 20. Um, and I represented my country in state multiple times. Um, now, I was just on cloud nine um, and, you know, was doing a lot of things at an early age and, um, then I met Shane and became Shane's uh, professional um, stable driver, which I just dedicated all my um, drives to to his stable. Um, and I was doing that six days a week, um, you know, and then I had my son and slowed down a little bit um, for about a month. <laughs> <laughs> then got going again. So it's just been just been from there, just full time driving. And I said when we came over to the States that I wanted to stop driving and um, slow right down. I was just doing way too much. And I, I already achieved what I wanted to achieve. Um, there was races there that I won that I never thought I could win um, ever. And um, I achieved all that. So I kind of set my goals early and tick the boxes and I sort of became that person that um I stayed very humble but I I just there was no nothing I looked forward to winning anymore I felt like I'd done it so early and um there was no races that would have um made me really excited anymore I wanted to watch um Shane train more winners in another country but um, and that made me excited again. I, I kind of burnt myself out a little bit early with the with the thoroughbred racing and everything like that. So, um, you know, I, I, I've had a really, really good, um, um, you know, life with the horses, but I, I really want to focus on training the horses now, which is what I've really focused on trying to do. Do you have any regrets of leaving school? Yes and no. Um mm-hmm. I wasn't very intelligent at school. Um, I 
feel like I the horses um I had a really bit of a rough rough childhood um my parents my parents separated and I went to the horses for comfort Mm -hmm. and because I wasn't intelligent I I kind of got um pushed to the side a lot and I feel like the horses were my happy place and that's where I wanted to be so school was school was just zoned out for me um yeah I didn't want to be there I wanted to be at the barn but I do not suggest leaving school because I was just lucky that I was good at something because if I wasn't it would be a lot different yeah Yeah. well and I think you know the school environment isn't for everyone not everyone can learn in that sort of structure yeah um but obviously you know I think the intelligence is there it was just the <laughs> the way they wanted you to learn didn't yeah work for you probably no it didn't and I mean I, I I probably didn't try very hard either because I knew what I wanted to do yeah and that wasn't at school but um yeah I I yeah definitely if I'm just very lucky that things fell the way they fell because I would be working some really crazy job right now trying to earn money you know it's just right you've got to be very careful that way yeah but I think you also worked very hard for it as well yeah, you know for sure you it sounds like away it. from yourself I did, I did I did work very hard and uh, I mean I see a lot of young kids that don't work hard and just think that everything falls on a nice silver spoon a platter with a nice silver spoon sitting on the end of it. It does not work that way. <laughs> yeah, especially with horses. I mean, yeah. I think you get out what you put into it with Absolutely. them. Yeah. And, you know, everybody else has to work so hard. You know, it's it's a 24-7 job, really, if you're taking care of them and and competing. And it's just so... It's based on, you know, the hours that you can put into Absolutely. it, really. I raced yesterday at Tioga and I left home on Friday morning at 10 o'clock and I got home at 11 p.m. last night. So yeah. <laughs> it's definitely a full time. There's no, yeah. I, there's no, it's I, a life. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a yeah. lifestyle. Like you, you live and breathe it. It's a life. It's your lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I giggle to myself when we have staff come and they're like, what are the hours? Like, well, <laughs> <laughs> can't really tell you that, but uh, just <laughs> plan on being there. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, were your was your family horse oriented? Uh, my mom was. Um, I have a younger sister. There's nine years between me and my sister. She's the younger sister. Um, my mom was uh, always a um, just pleasure rider uh, horse shows. She did a lot of, a lot of stuff with me, um, and I actually brought my sister into. She tried riding. She wasn't great at riding um she actually we got her a uh, mini pony trotter and she actually won some of the biggest race pony trot races there is in our country so she was very successful at that and uh, at the age of 16 she got her race license and she's actually being a very successful female driver in Australia right now um she's 20 so she's doing very well for herself she she always complains that you know, everyone says you're Lauren's little sister. And I said, well, how about you, you know, work on the goal of becoming, um, you know, I'm Grace's big sister, you know, so <laughs> you know, she, she had big shoes to fill, but she she's doing a really good job and um, I'm very proud of it. That's yeah. so cool. Well, it's funny because my whole life I've been Chuck Connor's daughter. (laughs) (laughs) Even my mom, my mom gets it too. And she's like, one day I just wish they'd call me by my name, you know? (laughs) Well, my mom always gets insulted because she's like, I'm your mother. (laughs) Yeah. You're not just Chuck's daughter. He didn't have you on his own. (laughs) Yeah, that's for sure. (laughs) And, um, you know, you've talked about some of your accomplishments and the goals that you set when you were younger. How did you navigate your way to accomplishing those goals in such a male-dominated sport? Um, look, as I probably explained before, you know, I just I worked really, really hard. Um, I ignored the fact that it was a male-dominated sport. I don't think that even really um, came to me. Um, yeah. It's not really named and that male dominated sport so much in Australia because I think like I battled out our um driving premiership with another girl for years. You know, mm-hmm. it's not it's not 
um, out of the ordinary. Um, we don't have amateur drivers in Australia, so you, you're thrown to the wolves when you get your license. It's you know you're, you're straight out in the in the open classes, and if you can't compete, then you you leave. If you can, you you go for it. You know so. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until I moved here that I copped a big slap in the face about, you know, being a female and am I going to be able to cope, you know, and, you know, um, I, I'd already been there and done that, uh, factor. So it didn't even bother me. Um, it's rough. It's really rough out there. You know, the, the comments still get thrown around, but it's just up to you whether you can cope with those. I, I always, um, have been a person that gets motivated motivated by negative. Um, you know, it, the negative will never bring me down. It actually makes me go harder. So um, that to me is probably one of the best pieces of advice I could give to a, a young woman or any woman at, at that point is um, uh, thrive off the negativity because it'll take you a long way. Mm. Was that something you had to work on or did it always, was it always there for you? Oh, absolutely. It was very tough. There was times there, um, you know, that I would, you know, felt like locking myself in my bedroom and, and, and being like, you know, why do I bother? But then, it, it, you know, for a young woman, um, you know, I, I to 16 to 18, I'd, I'd won races that nobody had won in, in at that age. And it was a lot for me, but um, it earned me a lot of respect as well. Um you know, a couple of people said, oh, maybe I'm just lucky, you know, maybe I, I you know, I, I, I was on good horses and it, it doesn't matter. I still did it, you know, and you got to, you know, I went through the stage of deleting social media and speaking to a, a sports psychiatrist and, and things like that. But none of that to me, I felt like worked. It was, mm. you know, you had to set your own mindset of, um, of thriving off the negativity and blocking it all out. And, you know, when you go out onto that track, the minute you get behind that horse, your whole mindset needs to change, clear headed, you know, and it took a long time. Like I, you know, I'm nearly 30 now. And I think it, I think it took years for me to, you know, there's still days there where it goes to, goes to run over my mind. But the minute I step out onto the track, it's, it's clear, it's off you go. And I mean, I still make mistakes. Uh, I still have a foggy brain. I still, you know, it's it's split decision things, but um, you know the the whole male female thing that does not bother me anymore, and I, I just I just wish it wouldn't bother anyone else either. It needs to stop. Right. Yeah, it's very interesting that you say that because um, you on our next question is going to talk about you winning the battle of Lake Erie, right. And, and what that has done for you, if anything at all, but um, you won that on the same day that Jenna Antonucci won the Belmont yeah. and I'm good friends with Jenna and she's trained thoroughbreds for me and she's been on the podcast before. And I actually recently saw her at a women in racing seminar in Saratoga. And she said exactly what you said that to her, she never noticed it being male dominated because growing up everybody like when she was riding as a kid and whatnot they were all women yeah. that she mm -hmm. rode with and had herself surrounded with so like that didn't even seem to be a factor and you know she was like people are making a big deal out of it but I, I don't see it being that big of a deal I'm just doing my job yeah absolutely mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree with that more she actually said it probably more better than what I have um mm -hmm. you know in it, it, as, even, even growing up at pony club you always say oh look you know you, you had a little girl, you know, she's going to grow up to be a horse girl. You never say that about a boy, you know, he's, oh, he's going right. to be a sport boy, you know. Um, I, so I just don't understand why it's such a big deal. And even if I am a female, so what, you know, congratulations, you want to race, you know, and it's it just I don't understand why it's such a big deal. And, you know, if I go out there and make more mistakes than a male, then maybe I'm just not as good at my job. But why does it need to be a male-female thing, you know, like it just mm. – just move on. I, 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 I really don't know why it needs to be such a big deal. And so after winning the Battle of Lake Erie, did it have an impact on your life, on your business from being the first female? Um, not on my business so much. You know, um, my husband was obviously extremely proud of me, or, you know, my staff and, and things like that. But I do, it did have a big impact on um, younger women. I had a lot of women reach out to me after that and congratulated me for that win, um, you know, and that I actually went out there in another, you know, 
at a, a track like that with a huge crowd and um in Ohio and and raced up against some of the best horses in our country at that time it was just it was just a real I think it was the point where everyone went oh okay she's actually going to go out there and do it she's not just racing in an overnight at at, you know a small track or or anything like that um but I love winning those races I love going out to new tracks and driving against new drivers and great horses and under big crowds like that and you know, I, I had a lot of women reach out to me after that, and and you know, say, you know, you, you're inspiring us to to go out and, and and race more and and things like that. And it's a shame that it has to get to that. Like, I, I just wish women would just go out and try it. You know, if you're not great at it, so what? You know, you you did it, you tried it. You know, um, but yeah, I, I feel like every time I, I win a race, I have a lot of women reach out and and thank me for something that I've done. You know, I, I had a really long message off a lovely lady one day saying that she was so scared to just take that leap to the races and, and watching me, she, she'd actually take that, took that leap and she'd won her first amateur race. So it was really, really nice to see. And I hope women, more women can get out there and, and do it. Yeah, and I think Jenna has had the same impact. Um, you know, even talking to women at the Women in Racing seminar that I was at, you know, that's what they were all talking about is like her, how she's inspired younger women to like go for it, right? And I think that that we've talked about this a lot on on the podcast about how you know women want to be 100 percent prepared before they go and do it, and you know, it's it's nice to hear that you're you know the message is just just go do it yeah Yeah. it's sad that it's come to that like I don't understand why we're we're so more worried about um what a man would think about if we if we made a mistake you know like or or worried about failing like there's nine you could talk to nine out of ten men and they're all scared of failing too it's just the fact that you're a woman you have that self-conscious of what the males will think of you if you make mistakes or, you know, and it's a couple, a couple of times I've gone out onto the track here and I've, I've driven a bad race and I come back and I feel like all the men are talking about me, you know, and they're probably not, they're probably <laughs> right. They're give two crabs about me, but they're probably, <laughs> I just had that self-conscious that they're all saying, you know, um, did you see that? You know, that, did you see her? Did you see her make that mistake? And they're, they're probably talking about what happened in the football yesterday, you know, <laughs> right. the simple fact that we think like that, we need to stop thinking like that and just completely ignoring it and just make that change that we're all scared of making, you know? So, yeah. yeah. When you were in Australia, you said when you were young, you set a lot of goals for yourself and, you know, races that you aimed for. Um, when you came to the U.S., was this race one of your goals or did it just come about naturally? I honestly didn't. I didn't want to drive um, when I came to the States. I wanted to focus on training a lot more. I was a little bit burnt out when I left. Um, uh, but this, I, I received a phone call about um, this really special horse from Australia that um, the owner wanted me to um, train. Um, he needed Lasix. So uh, he came to the States to our stables uh, to train. And um, he's an extremely special horse and very talented. And we set this race for him um, when we first got him. And um, when the horse turned up in my barn, I said, no one's touching him. I will, I will drive him. I will train him. I will feed him. No one is touching this horse. So um, we made a partnership and um, we won our first race at the Meadowlands and then um, we set sail for all the stakes races. And, um, you know, and to, to win, winning on him was more, probably more special than any race that I've ever won. Um, mm. And doing it, obviously, in the United States was even a bonus. But, you know, I, 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 that was definitely a goal that I'd set when the horse stepped foot in my barn. Cool. Yeah. And we've talked a lot about um, you working with your husband in your business. What do you think is key to be able to, to do that successfully with your partner? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's hard. It's a really hard game. Um, you know, I, I think anyone would agree with me with this, but we um, would fight a lot, like argue. just his point, my point, who's going to be right, who's going to be wrong. Um, but you know, 
um, we've been we've been together for 10 years now so we got to the point where his ideas bounce off mine and then we we work together on the ideas because arguing about the idea is not not the way to to have a successful business so um you know he's very smart and I, I feel like I I have experienced enough over the years that to to know um my part of things too you know um Shane's a mathematician so he's very good at organizing and and you know doing all the accounts and I had 95 horses in work in Australia, so I've seen enough injuries to become wow. my veterinary clinic. So I, <laughs> right. feel like I do that so part of things. And, um, you know, because I drive the horses in the races, I can tell Shane um, how the horse feels, if it feels different, if it feels, you know, if, I feel like if it's sore or, or, or doing things different to what it normally does at home. So I feel like that's a, a bonus for our business um, you know, knowing that side of the horse at home and at the races. So um, I feel like we work together in that in that point of view. Was that 95 horses like all racing? And Yes. Wow. It wasn't yeah. just like some young horses on the no, side. And no, no, no. Holy cow. 95 horses in work. And then we relocated and I think we had 83. And then we went down to 60, 63. And then we we. But about two weeks before we left, we had 40. And then we... Like we, a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> we, only bring, we only bring 14 with us. So I, I think that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. How many employees did you have? Um, it was very family orientated, our business. I had um, my mom, my mother-in-law, my sister working, and Shane and I obviously working at the time. I think we had four or five other staff um it definitely um probably one thing I didn't add when you asked me the question about changing our business was um our barn work is a lot different uh over here than what it was in Australia um you know you have grooms that just groom and then you have riders that ride the horses we didn't do that it was very everyone gets there everyone gets in and does their part you know you, you don't have your certain amount of horses to look after it's a it's and I struggled with that a lot here I I I'm very like, um, you know, when you finish your barn work, if someone's still doing something, we all get in and help them do something where I feel like here, if it's like, that's your horse and this is my horse, if you're finished, you go home and then that, that poor guy's left to do his other five horses, you know, like I, I struggled with that a little bit. Um, but, um, my, my staff wanted it like that. So I ended up having to, to remodel my my uh, mindset into theirs, so um, it works now. But it, I struggled with it for a fair bit. I, I, I'm very like, um, you know, I like to finish when everyone else finishes and and make sure everything's done before we all leave and and things like that. But you know, I ended up we 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 changed a couple of things. <laughs> yeah. And how do you balance being a mother and and a driver and a trainer and running your business? Um, I mean, the, the kids obviously you have to be with you a fair amount of time too if you're traveling right yeah yeah so it's it's quite hard but I'm very lucky very my kids are my kids are really good they kind of cart around with me everywhere but I I balance it too um I have not really much support I have my father-in-law and his wife um they help out a fair bit but um I I've always said that when I decided to have kids that I would be there for my children so I I do the best I can um I work a lot in school hours, school hours, yeah. my my rush hours. So um, <laughs> I get as much done as possible. Yes, I am a little bit late to the barn. I get to the barn about nine o'clock, which I hate. But, um, you know, I drop the kids off at school and get as much as I can done before three o'clock. And, and um, you know, I'm home with my kids. But um, when it comes to the races um, that I need to be at, um, they'll either come with me or um, stay with, with Nanny and Poppy. But um other than that, on weekends, my daughter is absolutely horse obsessed. So <laughs> she's uh, tagging along behind me everywhere, and she's got her two little ponies now. So she's starting <laughs> the ropes with her with her little with her little stable. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I I think I saw a video of her feeding the pony on the back deck. Yeah, right. she was eating off the deck too. Yes, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> it was really she, cute. She's a dog and a horse. Yeah. She's going through that stage where she's not sure what animal she wants to be. Well, it's been such a pleasure talking to you about um, 
your job and your the transition to the U.S. and learning more about you. We really appreciate you um, speaking with us. No, and thanks for having me. It's really good. And uh, look, if, you know, if there's anything that I can say at the end is, you know, I'd love to make a change of um, bringing younger people into the sport. You know, it, it, I really think that's where our next generation is going to come from. And they always, you know, mentioned that harness racing is a little bit of a dying sport. And I really hope not because there's so many opportunities for younger people to come in and, and, and enjoy the thrill and that I, especially that I get out of it still. And, you know, it, it's horses can have so much of an impact, as you know, on, on um, feelings, you know, emotional and, and mental health. And I, I really think there's so many opportunities for younger people to experience all that as well. And, Hopefully, um, you know, there's someone out there that can give us a hand of changing that, um, and especially the women in male um, parts of things. You know, it's we can all do it, and if we're successful at it, who cares what we are, you know, and, and just ignore the fact that it's still a thing that um, females don't belong out there, you know. Mm. So at the end of each episode, um we ask the same four questions to each guest and Connor starts with the first. What is one action that women can take to make a big difference in their lives? Oh, that's a good one. Um, what action? Okay. Um, how about we, we, the action we take about trying to change um, our mindset on things, you know, um, don't think that we have to be, someone else or something else to be able to do something i love mm -hmm. that yeah absolutely love that mm -hmm. and cool. what is the best habit that keeps you motivated personally success <laughs> I, love, I love success i love yeah i'm gonna leave that success <laughs> yeah and and then it's how success is however you define it right absolutely. yeah not whatever other people think success is yeah, forget other people worry about us yep <laughs> what's your favorite horse movie hmm. i have a few but i'm gonna say secretariat he has the mindset of a couple of horses that i've had maybe not as talented but he has that mindset uh, of a couple of horses that i've had and it's but it's really um that's me I'm, I'm a i'm a person that likes to yeah you know if anyone's watched secretary i think that's me in a couple horses that I've had in, my, in the past. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and who would you recommend to be a future guest on this podcast? Um, look, there's someone that I, her name's Nancy Tacta. She's a very highly successful um, female trainer. Um, she's very, um, she's copped a lot of um, backlash on her as a female being a successful trainer um her dad was also a successful trainer so she kind of gets the um you know you're 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 only successful because of your dad kind of backlash and mm. um I think she's had the same mindset as me she's very um you know she she gets very arrogant when it comes to um people telling her those things and I, I feel like she's got a lot of words of wisdom to to push um females into be, you know saying that you know you you're successful on your own from your hard work so I think she'd be a really good person to have on here and, and the things she's achieved over the years um and it's not really until I've moved here that I've realized her success so there's probably things that I don't even know about her that you probably you know get out of her on this podcast great well thanks again it was so much fun talking to you and learning more about you yeah no, thank, thank you so much thank you thanks guys I'm so glad you were able to reach out to Lauren and have her come on the show. I feel like um, she was, you know, different from other people that we've had on here as guests. And um, I think the first harness racer we've had. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it was really interesting to hear her story. And I feel like. I mean, she kind of just said, oh, yeah, well, we 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 took a risk and we moved. But, man, that is that a huge change for someone yeah. like 95 horses and winning everything in Australia and you move your husband and your kids and 14 horses all the way around the world during COVID during, during COVID. COVID and start over. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Wow. That's incredible and you know she's gone right back up to the top again it's so cool yeah. to see that and um i just 
I loved how candid she was about everything and, and, you know, talking about the difficulties that she had and, you know, how she keeps her mindset purely focused on what she's doing and the hard work that she has to put into it and kind of leaving all the rest behind. You know, it's kind of like being a racehorse, right? And you put the blinkers on and you just keep looking forward and going forward. And also, I love that message because we've had that message before on here where people talk about, you know, I don't really look at the competition. I just kind of put my head down and do what I need to do. And, you know, and just prove that, you know, if you do that, you're going to, you can be successful. Like she Mm. started over, they rebuilt their business and they're doing great. And I think one of the things I thought was interesting is how she was so candid about saying that, you know, she talked to a sports psychologist and she had, you know, tried all these tools. But the reality is there are a ton of tools out there. But if you don't do the work yourself, yeah. then then it doesn't work. You know, yeah. like, I, I mean, really, I I think about that a lot. Like if you can you can talk to everybody in the world, but if you don't actually do the work, then it, it you might not get where you want to go. Right. And then the other thing that I am not sure everybody realizes and when she was talking about like being at the barn and all the hours and everything in harness racing, you know, it's a little bit different than the hunter jumper world or having a, a, a barn, uh, a riding stable, um, because a lot of the work is done um, in the morning. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, sometimes there's a break and then there's racing in the evening or you go straight to the races. So, so their jobs, like a lot of stables do it where everybody has their own horse that they Mm -hmm. work on, like a a set of horses, a string of horses. Right. Um, And it's not a team effort. Like you clean your stalls, you do your job. Uh, Some barns are a team effort. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I think that sometimes, um, like when they had 95 horses, I'm pretty sure like you just all have to pitch in to get it done, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> yeah. it'd be really hard to be like, okay, these are your five and these are your five. And you right. Know. <laughs> yeah. Then you'd have what you'd need like 40 people working for you. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I mean, some barns do it and you know, that's fine. But yeah, I I imagine, you know, like, I understand where she came from and then coming over here. Yeah. Pretty traditionally, unless it's a smaller stable, like pretty traditionally, everybody has their own set of horses that they take care of. So just Mm -hmm. to clarify for people (laughs) who might not know the racing and, you know, also I love her passion for the sport and that she sees the need for younger people to be involved. Yeah. I loved that. That was really cool to see. You know, I thought it was funny because she kind of talks like she's a veteran of the industry and she is, but only because she turned pro at 14. You know what I mean? Like, you know, she's talking like it's been decades and she's only 29, but it really has been. And um, I think it's great. You know, she is, she does want to disabuse the notion that, it's something special for her to win as a female and stop putting people, you know, into categories of male versus female. But I still think it's special for her to have younger women reach out to her and say, you inspired me and I'm going to go do racing now because I saw what you accomplished. Um, So it's, it's really cool to see her want to, you know, help people out, and tell them how she accomplished it and tell them to go out and, you know, follow their dreams and take the risk and do it. You never know what's going to happen unless you just do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yep. know, it's, um, it was cool to, to hear, you know, how she, and she had like concrete ideas for it. It wasn't just, we need more young people in the industry. Well, how, you know, get right. them involved earlier find a program that can bring them into the sport without um you know they can't have their racing license till they're 16 but there's a lot of things you can do without the actual competition part yeah absolutely she's she's very inspirational i think and i'm glad to know that women have young women have reached out to her to you know 
ask for advice and say that she inspired them because we need more of that. Mm. So I'm, I'm really, I'm glad. And I'm glad that I got to highlight a, a person from harness racing on here because it is something that I'm passionate about. And, and I, you know, it's part of my background and who I am. So I'm glad that she yeah. could share her story with us. That was great. Yeah, it was good. So on to the next and you can find the links to today's guests and the show notes at www.eqbusinesswomen.com. Equestrian B2B is out twice a month on the 1st and the 15th. You can find out more at eqbusinesswomen.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Find Equestrian B2B wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to follow, subscribe, and leave a review. You can have all 20 plus shows of the Horse Radio Network with you wherever you go with their free app for iPhone and Android. Go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network. Now, go ignore the negativity. 